all right. Welcome, everybody. Happy Monday. Did everyone have a good weekend? Yeah? Good. Good, good, good. So today we're going to be doing a little bit on data validation. Um, and then I know, like, originally I think in our syllabus we had talked about um, data visualization today, but I wanted to do one more. There's a little bit of visualization as part of this, but I wanted to do just a little more on the data pre-processing side, and the next class we'll get into more on the visualization side of things. Uh, all right, so you can find these slides if you go to bit.ly, BEM392, slides three. That will bring you to this deck if you'd like to um, follow along. So the plan for today, I'm going to start by talking about this concept of column names as contracts, which basically is just this best practices. Um, sorry, I'm going to move these so I can see your beautiful faces. OK. Uh, basically, a, a best practice for naming your columns that makes your data pre-processing a lot easier. It also makes kind of creating tables a lot easier. And it makes um, your data dictionary creation a lot easier. So we're going to talk about that first. And then we're going to do a little bit on data cleaning in R. Several of you have come to meet with me about different R questions. And so I thought I would just show you some basics for um, how I like to clean my data in R. If you have other ways that you prefer, you're welcome to use those. So you by no means have to use uh, the methods that I'm showing for your projects. But this is just sort of the way that I like to clean data. And we'll do a little bit of practice with that. And then we're going to uh, do some data validation tools. And so what this is, is basically ways to build in automated checks so that after you've done your pre-processing on your data, you can check that basically your assumptions about the data are correct. The data validation is going to be especially helpful if you're using kind of some external data where there are expectations about kind of like if you, so for example, if you're working with data from the med, the med center and uh, there are lab values as part of that data set, there might be like kind of minimum and maximum realistic values that you could have for those labs. And the validation tools we're going to talk about today will allow you to sort of automate those checks to make sure that the, all of the values are actually what they should be. Um, so often, especially if you're working with like huge data sets, uh, you don't want to have to like look row by row to make sure that each of the um, observations are kind of clean. And so this is sort of going to show you some ways to do that programmatically. OK. So this column names as contracts, what this is, this comes from, there's this woman, M Emily Ryderer. She's got this blog post. Um, I linked down here to a talk that she gave based on this blog post. And you'll notice on uh, Canvas, I also added a link to a blog post that she wrote on this topic. Uh, so if you're interested in sort of learning more about it, I would encourage you to look at that. She works for, I believe, she's, I think she's still at Capital One. She's a data analyst. She's a very well-known R programmer. Uh, and so I, but she's probably someone to look to, especially because she's very much in the business analytics space, which I think a lot of you maybe are interested in that kind of area. And she's got a lot of good best practices on how to basically set yourself up for success on the front end when you're dealing with data. So she has this quote, column names are a way to align producers and consumers. So kind of coming back to that uh, idea when we were talking about the designing our analysis, kind of keeping our cons ultimate consumer in mind, this is sort of another way to make sure we're aligning like you as the analyst with kind of who your end product is going to be. So here is an example of a column name as a contract, as she would state it. So you start with some term. And you basically would have these be things that are you know, um, easy to understand, but also keywords that like your data team um, fully recognizes. So for example, ID being for like ID variables. And you map those terms to specific semantics. So any variable in your data set that starts with ID is always going to be a unique identifier. This is helpful because if you're working kind of with multiple different data sets, if you always use the same contract, that's what she means by column names as contracts, then you uh, don't have to spend as much time on the front end kind of learning about all your new data sets since you know that this is always going to be the case. Another example could be like IND for indicator. So if you see a variable that starts with IND, then you expect it to be binary, a 0, 1 indicator. Um, and, so, and then the rest of the name would describe what the uh, 
condition is for condition one. So when, when it's one, what that means. And part of the reason why it's helpful to have your column names named like this is because it makes the validation step really easy. So if every column that's supposed to be binary 0, 1 starts with I and D, then you could later build a validation on top of it to check that that condition is actually true for all those columns. And if you have like 100 different columns in your data set, this will make it much easier as opposed to having to like check one by one for each of them. You could just check all columns that start this way. Another one, for example, if it's a yes, no variable, you could have the, um, the column name start with yn. If it's a numeric, it could start with val for value. If it's categorical, it could be cat, dt might be date time, and tm might be a time, time stamp of an event. And so the term here is gonna be what the actual, what's gonna go into the variable name. Semantics is sort of what it refers to. And then contract, this is gonna be like what you would always expect. So what you're gonna actually validate based on the uh, column name that, you've, that you have uh, given. So for example, if there's a column that is prepended with the term ID, you would expect it to be you know, numeric, for example, and you would expect it to be like the primary key. So if you're expecting to only see one observation per row, then you would uh, expect that this would be unique. Uh, that you would only have, like that every single person in your data set would have a different ID. Or if in opposition you're expecting to have multiple <laughs> rows for the same ID. So for example, if you were working with, um, maybe you're working with theme park data and your ID indicates like the name of the ride, the, the ride is like the unique identifier, you might have multiple uh, uh, values. If it was like the kind of wait times on different dates, you might have multiple based on the um, you may have multiple values for each unique ID. Okay, so here's an example from the data set that we were working with last time, and we're gonna go back and work with that data set a little bit more. Uh, so here's like the different types of variables. We've got the ID, an indicator, yes, no, a value, a categorical, a date, time, and a timestamp. And then we've got the question types. And so uh, for this particular, the, the data set that we were working with just to um, uh, restate it was the Star Wars data set. It was based on a survey sent out by 538. And they asked a whole bunch of different type of questions. And I've categorized these questions um, for the purposes of this uh, column names as contracts into these five different categories. The first being seen questions. And so asking questions about whether the survey respondent had seen certain um, films. Fan questions, asking them if they were fans of certain franchises. Favor questions, which we're asking them basically uh, their uh, their favorite their favorite of different things. Rank questions, which asked them to rank. So I would expect those rank questions to kind of be uh, numeric output. And then demographic questions, which asked them questions about their demographics. And then with each of these, I end up with details. So for example, the question type scene, I might have like. Uh, a variable could be like yn, yes, no, underscore scene, underscore Star Wars. And that would be a question asking yes or no, did the survey um, respondent see Star, had they seen Star Wars? Or I could have uh, yes, no, scene, Star Trek. So the details sort of give me a little bit more information about this specific question. So that yn, scene, Star Trek would, would uh, be uh, the answers were uh, corresponding to where the respondent answered whether or not they had seen Star Trek. So here is sort of those examples written out in the actual variable names. So for example, I have here YN underscore scene underscore and then either Star Wars or Star Trek depending on which question it is. Or for my fan questions, those are gonna be YN underscore fan underscore either Star Wars, Star Trek, or expanded universe. Or if I'm asking uh, um, for the favor questions, that would be like cat underscore favor underscore Han Solo or Leia or R2D2, they have these for all the different characters. For the rank questions, um, I might ask, uh, or it might be this val underscore rank, so, this, so because it's prepended with val. I know this is going to be numeric output. The thing it's asking uh, the, the survey respondent is to rank, and it's asking them to rank episode one, episode two, and so on. Or, for example, I might have IND demographic female. 
So this would be an indicator of a demographic variable. And the indicator, when the indicator is equal to one, that would mean that the respondent was female. Or maybe I'd have cat demographic age. This indicates that this is a categorical variable and that uh, it's asking about a demographic question. The specific question is asking the age. So is that clear, kind of what is going on here? OK. So this is really helpful because, for example, when you're making tables, you can actually select variables based on these different quantities. So previously, we talked about using the GT summary package as a way to make these nice tables. And you had um, made a table with a single variable. I think we looked at uh, that, that who shot first variable. Um, but if instead I wanted to create a table that included maybe all of our numeric values and any demographic questions, I could do this. I could take my Star Wars survey data. I could use the select function. And we'll talk in a little bit about um, what select means, but this is just, select is just a way to pick specific columns. And then I can use these little keywords to be able to select just the columns that start with val, so this will get me all of my numeric columns, or I could get just my columns that contain demographic. And so that would get all those demographic columns. And so if I do this and I get do it, use this table summary, it will give me this nice summary uh, that only includes those. Okay, so let's try a little bit of this um, ourselves. I, I want you to go ahead and go back to this bit.ly BEM 392 R Studio. Now, when you go to this link, it's going to reopen that temporary copy of mine. I want you to save a new permanent copy as opposed to opening your old one. And the reason I'm having you do that is because I installed one additional package that you need for this. And so uh, when you save the new version, you should get that new package installed on your, in your project. Um, so don't open the, the one that you were working on last class. Make sure you open, uh, save a new one from this, from this little short link. That working for everyone? Yeah, okay. So once you have that open, go ahead and open that readme.md file again, and then either click preview or the visual editor, and then see if you can see how the gender variable is coded. See if you can see whether age is a continuous variable or binned, so categorical. And then once you've done that, Find the file where the data is cleaned and go ahead and open that. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do this and then we'll do it together. All right, so I am going to see. I want to make sure I'm not. Oh, is it the right? Okay. 
go to projects. I'm going to open my README. So can someone tell me how gender is coded in this data set based on this? And I can, if I click this little preview button, it'll let me see it in a little bit of a cleaner way. Exactly, it's an indicator, and in this case, it's going to be one is female since um, the way that I sort of define my contract for indicator is going to be that the term that's listed in the detail will always be what the one indicates. So this is sort of nice because, you know, obviously you can always look to the data dictionary itself, but uh, it's nice when the, you can allow the analyst to get as much done as they can without having to open additional files. And so, for example, here, knowing that this is going to be a zero one indicator and knowing that uh, it's been coded intentionally such that the term that's in the column name itself is when the indicator is one, I think is helpful. What about the age variable? Is that numeric or categorical? It's categorical and we can tell because it starts with this little cat um, underscore demographic underscore age. Nice, all right. And where can I find the data cleaning file? know where that is yeah yes so if I go to data folder and they cleaned it this will be the actual cleaned data set itself exactly and you could tell that because in that readme I had a little note uh, at the bottom that the current clean data is in that folder if I want to actually find the code to clean the data if I go into the code folder and then this o2 clean data that will be the one that will actually clean, clean the data set up. All right. Okay. Now I'm going to, let's see. All right, so the next part is about pipes. So you may have seen in the code a little bit, I have these, uh, they're called pipes. It's like this bar with a little arrow uh, or carrot pinned next to it. And so in R, with the way that these work is um, you can basically think about them as sort of dictating a sequence of actions. And so here's some pseudocode that uh, maybe will help drive home what this uh, pipe is doing. So let's say that we had the following sequence of actions that we wanted to complete. Obviously, this is not real R code. Um, but let's say we wanted to find our keys and then we wanted to unlock our car, and then we wanted to start our car, and then we wanted to drive to school, and then we wanted to park. In R, the way you would uh, do this is you would basically have this nested set of functions. So it would look something like this, where you basically would have to read them from the inside out in order to uh, execute in the order that sort of is um, makes sense in, in English. So on the inside here, we're gonna find, what are we gonna find? We're gonna find our keys, then we're gonna start our car, and then we're gonna drive uh, we might have an additional parameter, for example, when they say we're driving to campus, and then finally we're gonna park that car. So in R, like when you wanna when you wanna run something in like sequential order, it ends up being that you're sort of nesting these functions inside each other. And so I find this kind of nested version a little bit hard to read, which is what the pipe where the pipe comes in. The pipe basically allows you to write this exact same code but in sort of a more natural and easy to read structure. So it allows you to structure things kind of in the order that R is gonna run them um, as opposed to in this nested function order. So this exact same code could be written in pipes where I would find my keys and then I would start the car and then I would drive to campus and then I would park. And the way that it actually works behind the scenes is it just takes the, uh, whatever the object is on the left-hand side of the pipe and it sticks it into the first argument of the subsequent function on the right hand side of the pipe. And so you'll notice like if I'm reading this function from inside to out, if I start with this find keys, this is the, ar the first argument of the start car function. And so that's what's happening here. It's taking that find keys object and it's piping it into the start car function. And then this whole thing is inside, this is the first argument of the drive function. And so it's gonna take all of this, 
pipe it into the first argument of the drive function. You can have additional arguments after. So for example, the second argument of the drive function is to campus. And so by default, it's always going to pipe into the first argument and allow you to kind of list the, re the remaining arguments after. And then finally, we can add that final one. You don't have to use pipes when you're coding. I find when I'm doing kind of data cleaning and data validation type steps, it's just a little bit easier if I'm doing a whole bunch of steps to be able to think about them sequentially like this, which is why I like to use the pipe. You may have also seen a different looking pipe if you've used the pipe before. This pipe here with the, the little bar with the carrot, it's relatively new to R, so it was introduced into like base R just in the past couple years. Um, which means you don't have to have a package installed in order to use it. You can use it just like when you open R, it, it just exists. There was a pipe that had um, uh, percent signs in it. That came from a package called Magritter. That was sort of the original pipe. If you wanted to use that one, you had to install a package and load it each time. They work very similarly. So if you're familiar with the other pipe, um, it, it works very similarly to this. The main reason why I've switched over to this one is just because it doesn't have any package dependencies, and so I can use it even when I'm just running R code without loading any libraries. Okay, so I mentioned that you can, uh, you always will, it will always send the argument on the left side to the first argument, or the, the object on the left side to the first argument of the function on the right. Um, you can send results to a different, uh, to, to a different, um, argument by using the underscore. So for example, the lm function, the first argument is going to be the formula for that function. lm is just a way to fit a linear model in R. Uh, but sometimes you might want to like do some manipulation to the data set and then pass that to the data parameter, which is not the first argument of the lm function. In order to tell R that I want to do that, I just use the underscore. So by default, when I'm using a pipe, it's gonna try to put it in the first argument unless I use the underscore to tell it that I want it in a different argument. Are there questions about that? Yes. Yes, exactly. The underscore just is where, where you want it to go. So by default, it'll always go in the first, and then you can have a million more arguments after, the, after that first one, and those will just be the next arguments of the function. If you want it to go in any other place than the first, you just use the underscore to tell it where. All right. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about data wrangling. I like to do my data wrangling using this uh, the dplyr package, um, which comes with the tidyverse uh, suite of packages. So I'm going to show you a couple kind of um, high level tools or, or functions that I often use when I'm doing data cleaning. If you have other ways that you like to clean data, you're welcome to tune this out. You don't have to use my methods, but this is sort of the this is what I found is one of the easier ways to handle it. So dplyr, it's basically based on the concepts of functions as verbs that manipulate data frames. The dplyr package, it works very nicely with pipes because the first argument is always going to be a data frame, and then the subsequent arguments will be what you want to do to that data frame. So you can create these kind of linear steps for data cleaning by piping. You take your data frame, pipe it to something that does some cleaning, pipe it to the next thing that does cleaning, and so on. Um, it's the, it comes from the tidyverse package. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about ggplot when we're talking about data visualization, but the, it, uh, ggplot's a nice kind of grammar of graphics, and dplyr's a nice grammar of data manipulation. And by grammar, it just means that essentially the functions all share a shared language. So when you're, if you know how to work with one of the functions, then you will likely know how to work with the rest of them. Some of the main functions that we'll be using in dplyr our filter, so filter is a way to pick rows that match a certain criteria. Select, which we've already seen when we were uh, thinking about making a table. Select will just pick columns by a name. If you're familiar with SQL or any of these databases, a lot of these terms uh, were created to map back to SQL, so that's why these are the um, kind of keywords for those. Arrange will reorder rows, so that's basically like a sort. Mutate, I think this is like one of the worst named functions because it's not totally intuitive what it was. 
Um, but mutate basically will add new variables. That's a function that will allow you to add variables to your data frame. Distinct will filter your uh, data frame for unique rows. So for example, if you wanted to make sure that you only included um, each ID one time, you might use the distinct function. Summarize will reduce variables to values. So we'll basically summarize your data set um, for, uh, over a particular variable. And then there's lots more uh, additional ones, but these are sort of the big ones that you'll uh, likely be using for, for data cleaning purposes. So some rules for the dplyr functions. The first argument is always a data frame. This is nice because it allows for that easy piping. So you're basically can consistently update that data frame as you go. The subsequent arguments say what to do with that data frame, and it will always return a data frame. So again, this sort of makes it very nice for um, having a whole sequence of data cleaning steps that are all kind of piped together. An important piece here is that it does not modify in place. Does anyone know what I mean by modify in place? If you've taken a computer science class, maybe this is something that was talked about. So modifying in place would be like, if you change something about the data set, the initial data set that you are working on itself changes. So for example, Python, uh, by default will modify in place. Um, if you're used to using, uh, there's a package in R called data table, that also will modify in place. Modifying in place essentially is a, it's a storage saving uh, mechanism because instead of creating a brand new copy of the data frame, it will actually modify the original one based on what you've done before. dplyr doesn't do that, which means that every time you, you uh, do a dplyr step, it's creating a new data frame with that um, new information. And so there's a couple things that you need to know about that. First of all, that means that it's just a tad bit slower, although I don't think anyone in this class for the projects are working with data sets where you would notice that speed um, at all. You'd have to be in the like millions of rows to sort of notice the big speed difference. And the other thing that uh, that, that means is that you have to save your output. So if you take your original data, data frame and you do a bunch of steps to modify it, you would need to then save that final data frame as something um, in R in order to be able to use that cleaned data frame. Okay, so here are some examples. If I want to filter to select just a subset of rows, I can use the filter function. So for example, here, if I wanted to take my Star Wars survey data and I wanted to filter it to only uh, be where fans, uh, where, where my um, survey respondents are fans of Star Wars. I can use this filter function. I'm going to filter the column, yes, no, fans Star Wars, and I'm going to filter it uh, only when that's equal to yes. So what this is doing here is it's basically taking that full Star Wars survey data and the, the output of this is going to only contain the rows where the survey respondent indicated that they were a fan of Star Wars. So filtering is going to always reduce the, the number of rows in your data set. I could also filter for multiple conditions at once. So for example, um, what, what do you think would be the output of this filtered data set? You would only get female Star Wars fans. Exactly, you'd only have female Star Wars fans. So only where female uh, demographic is one and the Star Wars fans are equal to yes. So just, uh, this is probably a review for everyone, but just so you sort of have a single table where everything exists. These are all of the logical operators you can use in R. The filter function will utilize these logical operators in order to um, filter the rows as you've requested. So for example, this is a less than sign. It's defined as less than. So if you filter to only uh, rows that are less than a certain value, that's what you will get. So these are sort of all uh, numeric ways to filter on the, on the left side over here with less than, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, exactly equal to or not equal to. This ampersand is going to be and, so it will uh, operate on x and y. The pipe is or, so it will operate on x or y. And then there's a couple other key ones. If you want to test whether a, a particular variable is missing, you can use is.na. So for example, if you wanted to filter 
to only include data that was not missing, you could use the exclamation point for not and say not is.na, whatever the, um, the column is of interest. In is a special way to be able to test kind of containment. So if X is in Y, this is nice for like if you were trying to filter to have only certain categories. So for example, if I wanted to only include ages, you know, the age categories, 20 to 25 and 25 to 30, I would say if age is in, and then I could put a vector here, 20 to 25 or 25 to 30. And the exclamation point, again, is uh, not. OK, so that's filtering. The next is going to be select. So filtering is going to reduce rows. Select reduces columns. And so select is a way to keep variables. So what do you think would happen in this data set? What's happening in my first, with this first uh, line of code? That's right. So we're taking only females and Star Wars fans. And then what's happening in the second line down here? You're selecting their just like their rank of all the people. Exactly. We're selecting only columns that indicate their rank. So this reduced data set is going to have fewer rows because it will only have rows where they indicate that they're a Star Wars fan. And it will have fewer columns. So it will only contain columns that are uh, about the, the ranks of the various Star Wars films. You can also select to exclude variables. So for example, if I wanted to remove a specific variable from, I could just use this negative sign. And what that will do is remove the, the variable um, that, I've, that I've mentioned. So for example, if I wanted to drop the ID column from my data set, I could do this select minus ID. You can also select a range of variables. And what that will do is it's, gonna, uh, it's going to look within your data set, and it's going to select them in order that they, that they appear within the data set itself. So for example, here I have in order, I have this yes, no, scene, episode one. And then I have all the way up to yes, no, scene, episode six. And so if I use this little colon in between these, it's going to select just those six variables from yes, no, scene, episode one, two, three, four, five, and six. So this range um, is nice, but, it, but it's worth, kind of you want to double check when you use this particular tool because um, it's based on the order that the, that the columns fall within your data set. So you always want to sort of make sure that that's actually, um, that, that you're selecting the variables that you expect. All right, so distinct is a way to filter for unique rows. Um, a range is a way to sort. So what do you think is happening in this code? What, what am I doing first? Exactly. So I'm just gonna. So I'm gonna have a data frame that has all of my rows and just two columns, age and education. And then, what do you think distinct is doing? Yeah. So this is actually gonna reduce my data set to just the distinct combinations of age and education. So I'm gonna get a much smaller data set because I'm just looking at those two columns. And I've said I want just the distinct version. So I'm gonna basically look at every unique combination of age and demographics or age and education, rather. And then a range is going to basically sort the, that output by first demographic and then education. So what I'm going to see here is going to be this table, basically, that shows the uh, age category and then the um, individual education, um, the unique education uh, values for each of the age groups. So this is sort of a way to be able to check kind of uh, the what are the unique combinations of particular variables, if that was of interest? Another common one that we use is going to be group by. And this lets you do calculations on groups. And so this is a combination of both the group by and the summarize function. And so what do you think is happening here with this um, code?
Yes, exactly. So it's going to split them into the yes and no for whether they've seen Star Trek. And then it's summarizing them. The particular summary statistic it's calculating is the mean. So it's taking the average and it's asking the, the average rank of episode one. So it's taking within, we're going to see what the average rank for episode one is among those who have seen Star Trek and what the average rank for episode one is for those who have not seen Star Trek. And what do you think this na.rm equals true? What do you think that is doing? Yes, removing the NA. So the mean function in R by default, if you have any missing values, it's going to return NA. So it will, it will not calculate a mean if there are missing values unless you have this na.rm equals true, in which case it will just remove those na values and then calculate the mean among those that are not missing. Another uh, uh, function that we might use is the count. This will allow you to count observations in a group. So for example, um, it'll create like a little table. If I wanted to count the number that said yes to seeing Star Wars versus no, then I might use the count uh, function to do that. And then mutate uh, will add new variables. And so this is uh, here, I'm gonna use this mutate function. I am creating a new variable called cat demographic age recode. And this is gonna be equal to this case when basically allows you to build certain cases and recode certain variables accordingly. So for example, here, I'm saying that this new variable is equal to case when when the old variable cat underscore demographic age is missing, then it's going to be missing. Otherwise, if the category of demographic age is in 18 to 19 or 30 to 34, then I'm going to say this new uh, recoded variable is equal to 18 to 44. Or if it's in either of these categories, 45 to 60 or greater than 60, it's going to be equal to 45 plus. Now, most often, if you're defining a new variable with the mutate function, you'll also want to save the resulting data frame by writing over the original data frame, or you might want to call it something new, depending on kind of uh, your, your end goal there. So this save when you mutate, this has to do with what I mentioned at the beginning about it not saving in place. That means that if I run this code here without this, this little assign part, so just this part, it's going to print something in your console, but it's not actually saving that variable at all to the data set that you can use later. So in order to like save this output into a data frame that you can use later, you need to use this assigned variable like this. If you would like, you also can use the assign at the end. This is, so this is like, most people do it like this, where you um, take the, kind of you, you do all your manipulating and then right at the very beginning is where you're assigning it. It turns out in R, the arrow can go either direction. So if you prefer to write it like this, you can also do this. All right. And then often when I'm doing, when I'm uh, adding a mutate line, I often like to check just to make sure that it did what I was expecting. So for example, here I might count my recoded age and my actual age, like my original age for my data frame, to make sure, this will give me a little table to show me like every combination of, of each of those to make sure that it actually did what I thought it would so that it actually coded the age like I expected. Okay, so now let's try this uh, together. So what I want you to do first is go ahead and open this o2cleandata.r and take a look at lines eight to 13 See if you can um, understand what's happening and add a little comment to explain. Um, in R, to add comments, you use the little pound sign or the hashtag sign that will add a comment. So do that first. And then I want you to try to create a new variable called cat underscore demographic underscore age two that just has two categories. So you're going to use similar code to what I showed in the slides here. But I want this to just have two categories, uh, less than 30 and 30 plus. And then I want you to run a little check in the console, so using like a count to make sure it worked. And then if you run that whole um, uh, O2 clean data file, it will write your data set to this 
um, data, clean data, data.csv. So it'll overwrite your data with this new variable added. And then I want you to see if you can add a line to the data dictionary in the readme. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to work on that, and then we'll do it together. Okay, can someone tell me what this, these lines here, uh, 8 through 13 are doing? Or 8 through 14? Exactly. So it's saying, it's asking you, uh, it, it's asking for this yes, no scene episode one, where it's checking uh, whether any of them are missing. So if any of them are missing, it's NA. And if it's not equal to NA for the yes, no scene episode one, then it's equal to yes. And if, then if it's equal to this uh, yes, no scene Star Wars is no, then it's equal to no. And then in all of the other circumstances, it's equal to no. So it's trying to build this yes, no scene episode one that basically checks whether um, if they're all missing, it's missing. If the uh, yes, no scene episode one is not missing, then it's equal to yes. Otherwise, it's equal to no. Or, uh, well, or if, if they've not seen Star Wars at all, it's equal to no. And if there's any other, this is sort of a catch-all at the end, then it's equal to no. So let's, we can add a little comment here that says, like, creating a variable to assess whether viewer has seen 
episode one. Great. All right, so the next was to create a new variable, cat demographic age two, that had two categories, uh, less than 30 and 30 plus. So I'm gonna add this way down here. You can add it anywhere. I mean, maybe, maybe we'll put, we can put it up at the top, I guess, so that you don't have to scroll all the way down. But basically, we can, this mutate, um, you can add kind of multiple mutate functions in between here. So maybe we can add it right here. And then we're gonna pipe it into the subsequent piece. So what should I do to, well, first of all, what are we gonna call this variable? Yeah, cat demographic age two. And then how will I create it based on the cat demographic age variable that exists? Equals case when. <laughs> okay, so the first thing we're going to probably need to do before we do any of this is just to check what the actual categories are because. Since this is categorical, it has to exactly match the strings that the actual values are. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to run this. So I'm going to load my library and load my raw data. I've called it D. Down here in the console, I'm going to see, I'm going to just do this count cat demographic age. And so what that does is it tells me each of the categories that exist along with their counts. I don't actually care about the counts. I really just wanted to know what these values are. But this is sort of one way in order to do this. So instead of using this 0 to 29, I'm going to change this to 18 to 29 because 0 to 29 wasn't um, an option. And the first category, I think I want to be just 18 to 29. So I want that to be less than 30. So I'm going to check cat demographic age when it's in this uh, 18 to 29, the tilde says, so the left side of this is what I want to check for. And then when that condition is true, it'll be equal to what I stick on the right side of the tilde. So when cat demographic age is 18 to 29, I want it to be less than 30. And then when cat demographic age is in 30 to 44, 45 to 60, and greater than 60. I want it to be 30 plus. <coughs> One thing I like to do, um, R is pretty smart about this, but just to make sure that I don't accidentally misclassify these NA values, sometimes I like my very first one to be um, if it's missing, so I'm going to check is.na cat demographic age. If, the, if that is missing, then I want my output to be missing as well. So here, this in is going to check for basically if the variables here are if the values of this variable are in a set. In this case, because there's only one uh, value in this set, instead of writing in, could I write this line a different way? Yeah, I could use the equal. So I'm going to, I can comment that out and I can change that to cat demographic age equals, and I use the double equal when I'm doing like a test for equality. If it's equal to 18 to 29, then it's going to be less than 30. Otherwise, if it's in any of these, then it's going to be 30 plus. So these all, both of these lines would do the same thing. Are there any questions about making a new variable in R? the like first command that you were looking at and 
how it was making a variable called the SCRT necessary one, but then was like looking at a variable that was already called the SCRT necessary one. Yeah, so what's happening here is we're actually overwriting this variable. So let me show you, let, let me just show you what it looks like before. So if we look at this D, there is a variable here. We can even, if we click here, you can view what the data set looks like. There's this yes, no, scene episode one variable in this data set, but it's kind of weird. The name of the variable, or the, the value of the variable is actually like the name of that, um, of that movie as opposed to being just yes no so we have to kind of clean that up and this is based on basically how this data was collected it was like they would click on something such that this was just the output as opposed to being just a yes or a no and so what i'm doing here is i'm i'm gonna and i'm gonna look at that variable and i'm basically overwriting it with a new variable that will actually be yes or no but i'm using a little of the information there before i overwrite it If it was no, it would just be missing, this NA. Okay, so then the line opposes it because it's yes and see in Star Wars, both equals no. <coughs> yeah, so, that no, so this yes, no, see, this is a little bit, this one, so this, the one that we were just looking at oh, here is, I see, it's not episode one. It's yes, okay. there's this other variable, yes, no, seen Star Wars, oops, that is equal to, um, that's equal to either yes or no. And so what we're doing there is we're checking if they hadn't seen Star Wars at all, then we're going to assume that they also haven't seen episode one. Okay. Yeah. And then the line 20, where it says true. Yes. And no. Is that, what is that? So this is kind of like a catch-all. So what happens here is that first it's going to check whether any of them are, whether they're all missing. So if they're, if they are all missing, then the value is just going to be missing. If it's not missing, if that particular row or column rather is not missing, it's going to be yes. If they uh, said they hadn't seen Star Wars, then it's going to be no. And then true means in any other circumstance. So if there's any other circumstance that doesn't kind of exist under the things that we've checked, then it will be true or then it will be no. So it's like basically under if anything else, if these it, the way case when works is it works sequentially. So it checks this condition and then does, gives that response, checks the next condition, gives that response. If there's anything left over, if there's any rows that were not given a response, this is our, our default value ends up being no. We could have written, is, do you think, is there a way that we could write this case one to, ha to use that true condition as opposed to writing it like we did? Yeah, exactly, because this, this should cover all of the different conditions, so I could just do true 30 plus, and that should give me the same thing. So what happens here? And But what's important, uh, the reason why this works with the true is crucially because we checked for NA values first. If we didn't check for NA values before we used this true, then it would classify any rows that were either equal to 30 to 34, or 45 to 60, or greater than 60, or that, that were missing. And so that would be like a data entry error. We would not feel good about, about classifying all the missing ones as 30 plus. That would be probably a mistake. OK. So now, if I want to run all of this code, I can basically, hi I can highlight everything in this file and hit run. It's going to run all of this data cleaning. Oh, down here is where I uh, made a little spot for you to create that. Um, here, I'll, I'll move this so that we have it in the same spot. So here, so to uncomment the code below to get you started, here I'm going to, I'll just paste in that cat demographic age two. And then in order to write our cleaned data so it includes this new variable, I can use this write CSV. The data frame that I'm writing is this D, which is this new 
data frame that has all of this data cleaning involved. Uh, and I'm going to write it to this file, data, clean data, data.csv. And so now my cleaned data includes cat demographic age two, as well as these corrected yes, no variables. So now I can go back to my readme and I can update and add in under age. For example, I could add in an additional one. I could add this cat demographic age two. I can add another line here and copy this one and add another age um, less than 30 or 30 plus. All right. Okay, so why these column names uh, are nice to include like this because it, it makes a lot of processes easier, but one of them is the tidy selection. So basically the ability to select columns by name uh, that kind of that fall under certain categories. So this is nice um, for data cleaning. It's also nice for creating tables. If you want to create like a demographics table as well as a table of rankings and so on, you can easily select those columns using the keywords that you've created. And it's also good for data validation. And so these are the kind of keywords for tidy selection. Um, everything will just select all of the variables in your data set. Last underscore call will select the last variable. Sometimes that's like a special input, and so that can be useful. Starts with will select all variables that start with whatever keyword. So for example, if we code all of our uh, columns that are numeric to start with VAL, I could use that starts with VAL, and it would select just those numeric columns. Contains uh, is nice if you kind of if you have something like, for example, we had demographics was sort of in the middle of our of our column, so that contains will check whether the column name contains that. So, for example, here's uh, where um, here's here's an example where I'm doing some data cleaning. Uh, that would um, allow me to uh, change all of my variables at once. So I'm going to take my Star Wars survey data. I'm going to mutate, which means that I'm uh, updating a, a variable. So I'm either changing or adding a variable. And what this is going to do, this across uh, is going to take go across all of the variables that meet some condition. So I'm going to go across all variables that start with yn. So this is basically going to change all of my variables that start with that yn. And then to upper is a function that will change all those variables to uppercase. So what this, this, this code right here is basically a very simple way to be able to select just the uh, variables of interest, in this case, the ones that start with yn. And it's going to clean those all up so that they're all uppercase. This is nice, like if you had text input, for example, where some people uh, said yes with lowercase and some people said yes with uppercase, um, uh, you can sort of have it all consistent by, by running this code. Here's another example for tables. So for example, if I wanted to create a table of just my demographic variables, I could select all the variables that contain demographics and then use that table summary function to summarize. You also could do this for calculations. So for example, if I wanted to create a summary statistic across all variables that contain the word rank, so if I wanted to like get the median of all of those, I could use the across function across all variables that contain rank and take the median of all those. So it sort of just saves time for that. So for example, here I would get the, the median for each of these, so for episode one, two, and so on. Okay, in the last little bit, we're going to talk about data validation. So you've got like, yeah, almost we've got 12, 13 minutes. So there's this package in R called point blank. I've included here a link to the, um, to the help files for this package. There are a lot of different packages for doing this, but this one I think is my favorite, at least at the moment, for be able, being able to do data validation, especially in large data sets, partly because it actually it very nicely uses... Um, syntax that allows you to, if you are doing this kind of uh, column names as contracts um, method, it, it integrates very nicely with it. 
So I feel like lots of our packages suffer from this, but they use the kind of cutesy naming. The naming is supposed to be like um, agents that are like, the, the idea is that you're interrogating your data to like see if there's any data validation problems. So you take your, your table, you have these like actions, and then you create an agent that then looks at a whole bunch of validation functions. And then those validation functions get interrogated and then the agent has intel. So they have like information about what. So this is the, I think some of the names are like a little too cutesy, but that's where this is coming from. So it's a way to do data quality reporting. And so these are like the main functions that you would use. Um, so for example, call vals LT are the column data less than a specific value. Or call vals equal are the data columns equal to a specific value. Um, are they greater than or are they between? I think this is going to be the one that's most likely, most often used. So for example, like what I mentioned before, if you have like lab data where there are plausible values for this lab data, you could check where the, whether the column values fall between that plausible range. You can also check whether they're not null. So that will check whether there's any missing data. If you have an ID column and you want to make sure there's only one row per ID, you can use this rows distinct. You can check things like whether or not, um, if you think it's a character, if all the values are character or numeric, you can check that. The same for integer, logical, dates, factors, etc. So again, this is where it's, um, this link here will take you to the help files. It has a, a very cute video that has like, I'll start it. It's like it's very dramatic. The guy who made this is like very funny. So, anyways, you can watch this, and this shows you a little bit of a demo on how to actually implement this uh, data validation. It also has a little bit of installation. And the most useful part is this, these articles, which will have some overviews of the different things that you can do. So here's an example. I am going to take the Star Wars survey. Well, first I'm going to load the package, the point blank package. Then I'm going to take my, my survey data that I have just done all this data cleaning on. And then I'm going to create an agent. So this is always going to be the first step. We're going to create an agent that's going to investigate whether or not uh, these different uh, validation steps are true. I'm going to check whether the ID column is not null. So this first one is checking whether the, there are actual values in the ID column. I'm then going to check whether that ID column is distinct. So that makes sure that I don't have multiple rows uh, for my individual IDs. I'm going to check that all columns that start with cat are categorical or character values. I'm going to check that all of my rank columns fall between 0 and 6 or are missing. So there, I allow them to be missing, but otherwise they have to fall between 0 and 6. And then I'm going to interrogate. So I'm going to run, if I run all of this, it will check each of these individual points. And then it will give me this nice interactive output that shows me each of my steps. So these are each of the things that I was checking. It shows me which columns it was checking it for. And then it gives me a little bit of an indicator for whether or not it passed. You can actually click on it. So if, they, if there are no issues, these will all be checks. If there was a particular issue, it would give you a little indicator where you could click on it and see which rows didn't follow the, uh, what you expected. And then you could look into those a little bit further. Here's another example. Uh, I can check the, whether the columns fall into a specific set. So for example, I can check whether the yes, no scene episode one falls just in a yes or no and interrogate that. And so here, when I ran that, I ended up having a subset that failed here. So 351 failed. And that, um, but I didn't get, so if you notice this, I, it said no evaluation issues, even though there were 351 failures. And that's because you can set these uh, action levels, like basically when to warn at, at what percent of uh, you should warn. So in this case, um, you know, 30% were, were having a problem. I can say that I want to warn if it's just 10% that have a problem. And I get this little red or little orange um, dot that, that lets me know that there's a warning because that's been 
that's there there are some that are that are not yes or no and in this case it's because i have this uh, na values for 30 percent of the, the, the data actually are missing so if i update my call vowels in a set and i have it yes no or missing uh, then i end up losing that warning and i end up with zero failures here so it's just a way to be able to sort of build in these automated checks especially if you're doing a lot of data cleaning, it's really nice because you can uh, essentially check um, over and over as you're doing your cleaning that you haven't messed up anything else in your data set, which is usually a good thing to, to double check on. Okay, so we're gonna make a couple uh, checks here. We've got not a lot of time, so let's code this up together. We're gonna open the reports dot, uh, this should say QMD file and we're going to create a check that that cat demographic age two has two categories. And then we're going to check that all yes, no variables contain only yes or no, and that all favor variables have the right categories. So let's go here. I'm going to find my report.qmd under the reports. <clears throat> And so I have a couple checks built in already. You'll notice here I've got my, uh, well, first we've got my data that I'm going to go ahead and make sure I read in. This is my cleaned data set. I'm calling it Star Wars underscore survey. I'm going to change this eval equal to true so it actually evaluates this when I run my report. I've got this expected favor set. So this is what I expect to see for the favor for all the favor variables. We're gonna use that in just a second. First, let's ch add a check that our uh, two category age variable worked. So I'm gonna say uh, call vowels in set. And what am I gonna put as the first uh, argument here? What's the name of the column I'm checking? In this case, so this first one, the first check is going to be for that two category age variable that we just created. But we'll do the YN in just a second when we're doing the yes, no one. What did we call that new variable? Yeah, cat demographic age two. So that's the name of my variable. The next thing I want to, to put is my set. So this is what I want to check that it's in this set. I want to check that it just has two potential values, either less than 30 or 30 plus. Let's make sure that, let's see, what did I, yeah, that's how I wrote it here, less than 30, 30 plus. Or we have one other option, it could just be missing, so I'll allow that as well. Okay, so this is going to check the columns, whether or not this particular column is in this set. The next check that I want to do is for all yes, no variables. I want to make sure those are all equal to either yes or no. So we can use the starts with yn, and that will check, this will check just columns that start with yes or no. So this is where like having this consistent naming is really helpful. Instead of having to add a separate line for every single yes, no variable, I can just add starts with yn. And for that set, I'll try yes, no, and missing. I think this is going to give us some errors, which is good. So you can see what happens there. And then the final one, I want to add a check for all variables that contain favor using the set defined above. So I called this set expected favor set. And so what function would I use uh, to run this check? What's the function to check whether it's in a set? We call vowels in set, and then what will be my uh, specification here? What, what am I 
checking for this one. Which columns am I checking? Contain favor, and then the set is just going to be equal to this uh, expected favor set that I set up here. Let's give a second in case folks are typing, and then we can render it and see what happens when we run this. All right, so I can check out my HTML file, and I see here this tells me uh, all of the different checks. So at the top, these green ones are all ones that passed. Those all look good, but then way down here, I see several that had yellow. So those would be ones that didn't quite pass, and I can see what was going on in those. So for example, here I was expecting to see the set that I defined was yes, no, or NA where yes and no both uh, started with a capital letter. Uh, this, it told me that this yes, no seen Star Wars, it didn't match that. In fact, it looks like 100% of the time uh, it, it didn't match that. And so I can check out kind of what actually went wrong here. Uh, I can see which ones uh, had the issue by clicking on this CSV. It shows me all of the failed rows and so if I open it, it can give me a sense for sort of what my problem is. So if I look at this, these are all the rows that failed that check. Can you see why these failed my check? It's lowercase, exactly. So I was expecting it to be yes, no with a capital Y, and it turned out that this data set, they are all lowercase like this. One thing I could do to actually fix this is um, using that two upper in my data cleaning step where I make sure they're all uppercase, or I could use two lower to make sure they're all lowercase. Um, but in either way, I can make sure that they're all consistent that way. Let's rerun this and see if we get, uh, if we remove all of those errors, if I just add this to lowercase y and lowercase n. So now in this rerun version, you'll notice these are all green. I only have one problem here in this uh, Boba Fett. It looks like there were 138 rows that had a problem. And we can check out what those are by looking at that exception set. So this was saying that these rows had a problem for that cat favor Boba Fett, which is this one. And that's because some reason these are all coded as this is the way so it doesn't actually match what we were looking for which indicates that there's something kind of weird with this column so does that make sense does everyone see kind of how to validate their data yeah nice okay all right well i'll see you all on wednesday <laughs>